Welcome to our live weekly update of ongoing Russian operations in Ukraine. I'm Brian Berletic. Joining me as always is Angelo Giuliano. Uh, we're going to be talking about what is going on inside of Ukraine. This is about one month now into these operations that Russia is carrying out. And I want to remind people, as always, how we ended up here in the first place. In 2014, the U.S. government overthrew the elected government of Ukraine. Since then, they had put a hand-picked client regime into power, did not represent the Ukrainian people or its best interests. They proceeded to destroy the economy, divide the society. They waged an eight-year-long war against their own population in eastern Ukraine, the Donbas region. They killed uh, somewhere around 14,000 altogether, including over 3,000 civilians. So Russia did not start a war one month ago. They intervened in an ongoing war that started back in 2014, started by the United States. And this was part of a much wider process of encircling and encroaching upon uh, Russia along its borders, overthrowing governments, uh, putting regimes into power that would then choose to join NATO and the EU. This was not these countries deciding this on their own. And uh, what they were basically planning on doing was completing this process by absorbing Russia eventually, it ceasing to be a sovereign nation and it being absorbed into this blob that the U.S. controls in Western Europe, which is which is creeping up to their borders. And I want to remind, and we're going to talk about this because uh, this all leads to China. We're going to talk about how this is just one part of an even wider encirclement of Eurasia, uh, Russia, in the West and China in the East. We're gonna get into that toward the end of this, but let's do an update. Uh, first of all, Angelo, you've been following this closely as I have. Uh, do you have any impressions on what's going on now? We're one month into this this operation that Russia is carrying out. Uh, well, uh, the, the last news is, uh is that the Zelensky is getting very nervous. I think probably nervous of a, a, a possible coup, the internal coup. You saw uh, he, he just banned 11 po political parties. It's very funny when people, they say that uh, Ukraine is a democracy. It is not since 2014. I just want to add a few things. Why it is not? He just banned 11 parties. He closed major opposition uh, webs, uh, media, you know, in the last two years. He closed many, there's no dissent voices when it comes to media. Uh, he has arrested opposition leader, leaders, you know. One of the main opposition leaders is uh, Medvedchuk. Medvedchuk is more balanced, you know. He, he wants to, to just not, not to go on the frontal war with, uh, with Russia. Uh, they name a Nazi collaborator, hero of the nation. Uh, he's, he's actually working for a good oligarch. So he's been put in place by a very, you know, very rich oligarch. Then uh, the CIA and MI6 are giving direct orders to him. And he's been banning minority languages. So if people are still thinking that this is a democracy, it is not. It is the worst. It's the worst system. And it's been completely hijacked by, by the US since 2014. So it is, it is not. It's really important just to, to, to put it right. Because even the excuse of wanting to export a democracy, it's not there. It's the, the worst system, and it's run by neo-Nazi, by neo-Nazi, uh, you know, I mean, they actually, we shouldn't even call them neo-Nazi because they are the real deal. They are the real Nazi. They come from SS Galicia that did the worst crimes. Uh, if, if people can check SS Galicia, they, they were in charge of uh, Einsatzgruppen. It was terrible what they did. And they were so bad that they, uh, the, the Nazi, German Nazi, had to put in jail Stepan Bandera because he was just too bad. That yeah. gives you an idea of who we are dealing with. Yeah, they are, they are the directed descendants. This is a continuous process from the end of World War II up until now. The, these are the same organizations, the same traditions and, and culture, if you could even call it that. They are actual Nazis. They're not neo-Nazis inspired by Nazism. They are. They have a direct lineage all the way back to World War II and uh, perpetrating the, the Holocaust, killing Polish people, killing other Ukrainian people, just like they were doing for the last eight years, killing uh, their own people in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and so I, I had this up on the screen. Yes, absolutely, Angelo. Uh, he's suspending the opposition. He's consolidating control over the the media, so the even 
the superficial fake Western style democracy that they had has now been obliterated. So what exactly are they fighting for at this point? Uh, they're just fighting. Uh, and a lot I've heard this by a lot of people. They're fighting for America down to the last Ukrainian against Russia. It's a proxy war. This is what Ukraine was being set up to be since 2014. A lot of people said they had no chance of ever joining NATO. And uh, it, it didn't matter. As, as a matter of fact, I think not being part of NATO made it even more dangerous. Just look at Georgia in 2008. It was not part of NATO, but they were militarizing Georgia. They were training them, uh, dumping weapons into Georgia. And then they encouraged them to attack Russia. And we, we watch a little mini version of this play out. Now, uh, I got somebody outside passing. I don't know if people can hear that or not. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll, I'll mute my microphone bit. until they're gone. You could go ahead, Angelo. Please. No, it's, it's, it's good. It's good. I just want to add one thing. It's, it's really important. We, we are, uh, remember what I sent you yesterday. Uh, in February 2021, um, Zelensky signed a decree. It was basically a, a decree on, on wanting to take, take back Crimea. So this is, by definition, is, a, is an act of war. You know, it's going on frontal war with, with Russia. Uh, so it, it, is, it is very important that, that I mean, we, we're not, uh, not many uh, Western media are talking about this, but they amassed uh, troops. Ukrainians amassed troops around Donbas and down south, close to Crimea, uh, a month before the Russian invasion. And they started bombing, two weeks before the invasion, they started bombing massively Donbas. So what, what, uh, what Putin did was actually just, just do it, attack uh, Zelensky's troops before they were going to invade uh, Donbas. It is very important and, and lots of evidence are coming out these days. Yeah. And you, you started by saying that Zelensky is nervous, and I think he has every right to be nervous. When you look at this situation map, it looks like not much has changed, but people have to understand what is going on in Ukraine, what Russia is trying to accomplish, how they're trying to accomplish it. Uh, so if we look at this, this is pretty much very similar, but not, not really. There have been some minor gains. There's a, a port city near Mariupol that was taken by Russia with almost no fighting at all. The, the Navy just dropped their weapons and disappeared. And so that, that, was, that was over the last week. Uh, Mariupol is completely surrounded. You have these actual Nazis that are part of Ukraine's official armed forces refusing to lay down their arms. I don't know what the story is. I think they think there's going to be like a breakthrough or something like Kiev is going to rescue them because they, they honestly think that they're winning. For some reason, they think that they're winning. Uh, the propaganda is very powerful. And it, uh, you see these foreign volunteers going to Ukraine thinking this is going to be some kind of cakewalk and they're just going to be part of the mop up operation or something. It, it is completely the opposite of what is going on in reality. Uh, this last uh, couple of days, I've been this is the Pentagon. This is the U.S. State Department's official website. Senior defense official holds a background briefing. This was March 21, 2022. And uh, I want to direct people's attention to this right here. They're talking about the forces that Russia put along the border with Ukraine specifically for this operation, not the total that they have available to them overall. Just what they put on the border before they went into Ukraine they're at a month in now, they are at 90% from 100%. And this is the Pentagon saying this. This isn't Russia saying this. This is the Pentagon saying this. People in the Western media who have been getting high on their own supply of propaganda, they, they were asking, you know, is it, are they going to run out of missiles? The Pentagon says that Russia has not done any serious reinforcements uh, in terms of manpower, and they have not done any serious resupplying of the depots that they set up before this operation went ahead. So that they're not even really getting started yet. Uh, and I want to I want to I want to bring some points up to people. I want to compare what what Russia is trying to accomplish in Ukraine versus what the US did to Iraq in 2003. If you could see on the screen here, this is uh, the blue outline is Iraq and then this with the the black border. This that's Ukraine. So Ukraine's actually a little bit bigger than Iraq. Uh, Iraq has about, uh, I think it's like um, 25 million people population-wise in 2003. Ukraine has 44 million. So it's, it's almost, almost twice as many people in Ukraine than in Iraq. And it took the U.S. one month 
to reach and take Baghdad. And that was after years and years of crippling sanctions, punitive uh, bombing runs, uh, raids that the U.S. carried out over the years before the invasion to degrade Iraq's military capabilities versus the last eight years of the U.S. pumping billions in terms of weapons and training into Ukraine. So these are completely different situations. That, to act as if Russia somehow failed by not taking Ukraine overnight is completely ridiculous. I want to point out, too, that the U.S., together with the U.K., had almost half a million troops when they went into Iraq. And they went in guns blazing. They flattened everything. They killed everything in their path on their way to Baghdad. Russia is not doing that. Russia went in with almost a fifth of what the U.S. went into Iraq with. R Russia went into Ukraine with a fifth of that against a population almost twice as big. So you can see, thinking that, thinking that Russia was some somehow supposed to take Ukraine overnight. It's just ridiculous. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and people are saying, well, they thought that they would, and this is a big failure. If that was the case, why did they have so many men, so many weapons stationed all along the border to the point where they've been at this for a month now, and they've only uh, degraded their, their combat power allotted for this operation to 90%. Uh, Angela, you want to add in anything on this? I mean, it's just tr like when you look at the numbers and what the Pentagon themselves are saying versus the nonsense that we're hearing from the Western media, just it completely does not add up. Well, there's a huge difference. Uh, in Iraq, it was carpet bombing. It was about uh, destruct destructions of uh, infrastructure, just just kill completely the, the whole structure of a country. So they just carpet bombed for, for a couple of weeks and then they went in. Uh, what they're doing here is, uh, is taking more time because they, they want to preserve the civilian lives and they want to preserve infrastructure. They, you know, they want to keep in place the, the basic state infrastructure because yeah, that, that's very important. They don't want to put the chaos that they did in Iraq. Imagine, uh, I mean, next door, failed state, completely failed state. So, and, and what they want is a surrender. So they they going bit by bits and they're saying, well, we okay, well, we destroy this, you know, this part of your army. Okay, are you willing just to sit down and surrender? And those are the conditions. The conditions that they they, they put are no difference than pre-invasion. You know, it's about demilitarization, denazification, having Ukraine to be neutral, and and uh, the status of Donbas, the two Donbas regions. Donetsk and Lugansk, and also the status of Crimea. It's as simple as that. Why are they not surrendering? Because they're taking orders from NATO. So remember, NATO, what NATO did and the US did was to push Ukraine into war to confront Russia. And they're using Ukrainian blood to do that. What they did was to provide weapons. The problem is that now they are in a situation where NATO is completely humiliated and it's showing the world that, that they've been using another country to fight their imperialistic wars. And, it's, and that, that is a huge problem, especially when it comes to Taiwan, because the, you know, the next front is, is Taiwan. I'm expecting uh, by the fall they'll be, they'll be fully working on Taiwan to do exactly the same, saying, oh, you know what, why don't you confront China because we have you back. That's exactly what they did with Ukraine. They say, well, you know what? Fight Russia. Don't give up. I mean, be strong. You know, sign a decree that you, you are going to take back Crimea because we have you back. We are the strongest army in the world. Where is NATO? Nowhere. Nowhere to be seen. Do you know why? Because they have in front of them. It's not Syria they have. It's not Libya. And do you know when last time that NATO won a war. I mean, you know, maybe when they took Grenada, you know, but they were fighting farmers. But the last war was always a humiliation. You know, and uh, if it was not a humiliation, they ended up with a failed state. You know, what did they do in Libya? You know, they, they, Libya is completely destroyed. You know, what did, they, what did they achieve? For what? For what? I, I just saw in the comments, uh, someone asked me, why do I support Putin? Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that I, I'm not Russian, so I can't really uh, support the leader of Russia, but do I agree with what Russia is doing? I think what they're doing is absolutely necessary. There was no other 
option for Russia. Now, when you resort to military force, that is always, uh, that is always there's a failure somewhere where you were not strong enough to avoid war or, or win strategically by being strong enough. But you have to think of what happened to Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The U.S. and the U.K. and, and their allies went into Russia and pillaged it. Uh, the, the level of destitution, poverty, and violence in, in Russia at that time, it, it was virtually a failed state. And they had to fight tooth and nail to rebuild their country and to get back their sovereignty. They fought two wars within their own borders in Chechnya uh, against U.S.-backed militants. That was a back-to-back -back war to, to prevent part of their territory from being carved off. And then they had NATO expansion up to their border over all of these years. And again, these, these weren't countries choosing to join NATO. They were having their governments violently overthrown and puppet governments put in to choose to join NATO. And then add to that the fact that the U.S. from uh, the late 90s uh, all the way up until today have been going through the world destroying every single ally of Russia and also China. So think about the sanctions on Venezuela, for example, or on Cuba. Think about how the U.S. destroyed Iraq, destroyed Libya, is trying to destroy and right now is occupying Syria and also Yemen. So this, this wasn't something that Russia decided to do for fun or as as an opportunist. This was something they did in self-preservation. And whenever a nation is fighting for its, its existence, then yes, I support that. Ukraine is not a sovereign country. It had its government overthrown in 2014, it ceased to be a sovereign country. They're not fighting for their self-preservation. That fight was in 2014, they lost it. Uh, their, their hope of being a sovereign nation right now hangs in the balance and, and is dependent on how this plays out right now. And it is not up to, it's not Russia threatening their statehood. It has always been the U.S. and NATO. So I, I hope that answers that. Someone also asked, uh, how is Patrick Lancaster? He, is, he has been in eastern Ukraine this entire time covering the eight-year war uh, uh, pursued by the U.S.-backed regime in Kiev. Uh, he, he has a video that came out a, a day ago, so I'm not in direct contact with him, I don't know, but he, a, a, as recently as a day ago, has put out a video. He was Mariupol, and I mean, it's just destruction. They, the, the Nazis in, in Mariupol, actual Nazis, part of Ukraine's armed forces, they refuse to surrender, and so the whole city is being destroyed as they, they fight and refuse to lay down their arms. And they're hiding in, in schools and behind civilians. And I've even heard pro-NATO, pro-Ukrainian military analysts admit that that is what the Ukrainian military is doing there. They're being very smart by, by blending into urban terrain, which means uh, hiding behind civilians and civilian infrastructure. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, the the hypersonic missile. I did a video on that. Angela, you have any? Do you have any thoughts on the the hypersonic missile? It's uh, kinjal it means dagger in Russian. It was this. Uh, I think it's a warplane launched hypersonic missile. It hit an uh, ammo depot. Uh, it, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's a game changer. Uh, just because it, it's uh, Mac ten. Uh, it can be, you know, you, it's hard to detect you, you know, you can have a, the Iron Dome doesn't work on this. So basically you can, you know, you can destroy a complete fleet. So um, officially there's only China and Russia that have a hypersonic uh, missile. I, I, I mean, probably the U.S. has it too, but that means, it means that actually you, you know, practically the U.S. could be attacked on its own, own soil. Uh, why? My, I, I ask my, myself, why is uh, the U.S. so hawkish, you know, in Europe, in Southeast Asia? For, it's very simple. They're not fighting on their own soil. And then they're not fighting on their own blood. You know, they're just selling weapons. They're selling weapons and dividing and conquer. That's what they're doing. Now, if you have the U.S. that could be threatened on their own soil, that would change the, the complete game. With those missiles, if, if the U.S. realizes, well, you know what, if we are going to go into a, a, a nuclear confrontation, uh, I mean, oh, God, I mean, we, we never get to that. Uh, I mean, really, we have to avoid war at any cost. But at least if it becomes a deterrent, maybe that's the, that's the solution for peace. Because, because again, you know, you, you see, you see what, 
What the, the U.S. is doing around the world is saying, oh, we are threatened. Come on, you, we are talking about thousands and thousands of miles away from the U.S. Who is this threatening? You know, if war happens in, in, in Ukraine, I mean, large-scale scale wars, it's going to be the 1.5 million uh, European soldiers and only 100,000 American soldiers that are going to fight there, you know, but it's not going to be on, on American soil. It's going to be destroying. It is actually already destroying Europe. You know, the consequences, when you are talking about the, I mean, uh, economic consequences that this is happening right now in Europe are huge. And, and you know, it's not touching, it's, it's not touching the U.S. Again, you know, just uh, so, so, so you see, uh, so when it comes to the missiles, it's a, uh, uh, maybe this is a game changer and it's a, it's a good deterrent. Uh, it's the, the whole point is that it goes so quickly. Uh, it, first of all, it's creating a plasma field ahead of it, which absorbs radio waves, which means it is very difficult to see by radar. And because it's going so fast, there is so little time to actually intercept it. And uh, if you set a barrage of these, at a, a target like a fleet or a military base, it would be very difficult to stop them all, and they would almost certainly destroy. So it, it's a it's a very persuasive uh, non-nuclear deterrent, although they can also be fitted with nuclear warheads. So I think they're sending a message. Russia is sending a message to the West that uh, do not do not d directly intervene in Ukraine because this is what we will do. We will sink your ships and we will destroy your military bases. Uh, you, there will definitely be a significant price to pay. Uh, and uh, I just want to get back to this, this person who asked why I'm supporting Putin. And they said Russia didn't need that territory. They should focus on their own problems. This is their problem. The fact that NATO is expanding up to their border and then planning to cross that border and dissolve Russia like they tried in the 1990s, this is an existential threat. They're not in Ukraine for more territory. They have the largest country by area on earth and they don't even know what to do with all of the land and all of the resources in it. They they are, they want, need more people in Russia for the land that they already have. This was not about taking land. This was about stopping NATO. And if you're gonna look at what NATO has done the last 20 years alone and say, oh yeah, well, they were going to stop on their own. They were not going to stop unless someone made them stop. And how do you make them stop by, by going into Ukraine, this proxy that they were using and voiding it out, voiding everyone involved, voiding the military capabilities they gave Ukraine and showing what will happen to other nations that, that try to create themselves as a threat right on Russia's border it will not be tolerated. And the same process is playing out with uh, Taiwan versus China. And Ta it's even worse for China because Taiwan is actually part of China. And I think I'm just going to, because I think I know where this person is going to go with their, their line of questioning next. We'll just uh, keep them from, oops. Oh, that's cool. I can do that. I didn't know I could do that. So I could put uh, comments up on the screen. Now, how do I hide that? Ah, okay, cool. I didn't know I could do that. So now we, fi now we figured that out. Now I can put comments on the screen. That's great. I, I, okay. So we learn something new every single day every single day. Uh, so we, we, we might try that toward the end here. Uh, let's also, so the hypersonic missile, that was a big deal. Uh, the taking of this port near Mariupol, that is a big deal. The fighting in Mariupol, this is something that we need to keep an eye on. The fact that the Pentagon says that Russia is only down to 90% of its combat power allotted for this operation, that is a major deal. Now, I, this is what caught my attention. And uh, Angelo, uh, let's see what you think about this also, have you seen this? Uh, so this is a US Admiral complaining that China is militarizing the South China Sea, which I guess in a way they kind of are, but why? Angela, why do you think China feels the necessity to uh, militarize the South China Sea? Do you think that they want to disrupt shipping in the South China Sea? No, well, you know, it's very simple. It's uh, anti-missile, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a counter power projection. So basically defense. So, uh, and a lot of those islands are actually used for jamming, you know, jamming systems, you know, like uh, uh, anti-missile, uh, I mean, basically for protection, but they're getting ready. And, you know, the countries around the region, you know, because those islands are, you know, are problems, you know, they, they, there's, there's lots of uh, uh, tensions in, in the area, but they're not making a big fuss out of this, the, uh, the, region, the, the countries around that, because they know this is a defense. It's a defense for China. And they're getting ready. 
so you see uh don't i mean people they they realize you know they they, they have a short attention span and they don't see that long term what well, china probably what they're doing what china is doing now it started probably 20 30 years ago and the same as uh, what what putin did right now he it's what we call a contingency plan he didn't plan to attack ukraine but that was one of the plan if ukraine was to do this this and that and and and, and that, that's that's what they 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 ready uh, both china and russia they they're ready they're working hands in hands just to to counter this this uh, this project of a new global order you know i mean i don't know if you saw that that speech of uh, of uh, biden he still mentions we want this new global order and, and the thing is that you know it's failing completely it's backfiring completely you can see there's there's some interesting stuff happening uh, things that would be just unthinkable saudi arabia you know be agreeing to to deal uh, selling oil to china using and I mean, B. You have UAE meeting with Russia. You have and Syria. India. And Syria. And Syria. You, yeah. Exactly. You have India uh, willing just to buy non uh, uh, buy goods from from Russia, wheat and oil, and not in U.S. dollar. You see, this is backfiring. Actually, once the 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 trade, the global trade, is going to shift. Part of it is not going to be in U.S. dollar denominated currency. Then the whole game is going to change. You won't be able to print money for for free. You know, it's, it's gonna if you from now on if you print money U.S. dollar, you are going to have a, a hyperinflation. You won't be able to do that again. You know, it, it's been since the Bretton Woods uh, after war that the U.S. is living at the expense of the rest of the world. Why? Because they have the global currency. They need money, they print money. Or they impose countries to buy U.S. debt. Now, you know, it, in the last five years, neither Russia or China has been buying U.S. debt. They don't. They've been recycling. Uh, Russia has, has completely dumped its U.S. bonds and U.S. dollar. And, and, and China has been recycling its uh, U.S. dollar trade surplus into the Belt and Road Initiative and into gold. And this is why this whole everything is crumbling. It's collapsing, and and, and this is actually this this is a, the the tipping point. What is happening in Ukraine? Don't look at Ukraine as a single event. This is a tipping point. From this, everything is going to change. And the ultimate game is money. Keep in mind, it's always money. I just want you to do the parallels to the opium war. It was exactly the same. Opium war was. Uh, there was a huge trade surplus, you know, China had a huge sur trade surplus with, with England and it was amassing lots of, of uh, 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 silver. So the, England had no more silver and this is why he attacked China. He deposed China to buy opium, uh, uh, op opium uh, uh, to, 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 to balance the, the, the trades between uh, England and, and China. So this, it's come, it comes down to money and trade and and on this front both the eu and the us are are, are failing yeah and uh, i i was listening to some some financial commentary regarding russia and its preparations for this current operation which go back years and uh, this one particular person said 14 years which i i can believe because this was a problem that you could see coming from years ago years ago we were talking about this and writing, uh, I was writing about this back in 2011, the Arab Spring, John McCain, a uh, US Senator now, now passed away. He had said that the Arab Spring was a, a virus, their virus that was going to go eventually to Russia and China. So they, they knew about this, they knew this threat and they've been preparing for it ever since, creating their own social media networks, creating alternatives to the Western financial uh, system, the SWIFT system, for example. Uh, all of these uh, testing the waters for, for trading in local currencies, this was all being done before this ever unfolded, knowing that this was the eventual, uh, where this was all going. And China knows that what is being done to Russia right now is just in preparation for the West ultimately doing it to China. They're already they're already putting in the hooks to to pull China into this this whole sanction 
uh, regime that they're they're releasing on Russia. Uh, now, because I can share the the comments, uh, I want to point out this right here. That this is absolutely true, and I hear people doing this. If you see me comparing what Russia is doing in Ukraine to Iraq, it's just in terms of numbers. I would just want to show people how few, how many fewer troops Russia sent in in a country with a much larger population versus what, what the US did. And what the US did was completely destroy Iraq to the point where uh, 20, 20 years, it's still wrecked. It's still trying to pick itself back up. Uh, and yes, absolutely, the US lied. Iraq posed absolutely no threat whatsoever to the United States and they went in and they destroyed that country. Russia, uh, and it's very clear that Ukraine was an existential threat to Russia. The US was uh, training them, dumping billions in weapons. The Ukrainian regime was killing ethnic Russians right on Russia's doorstep. And just like you said earlier, Angelo, they every every year it was like a little tradition that they started since 2014. We're going to take back uh, Crimea by force, which was it's occup it's pe Russian people live there, and they overwhelmingly decided to rejoin. Uh, Russia. So there's this one. There's one more comment. Because I can, I, can I, I, I one thing, uh, Brian. Sure. I want to uh, because uh, I take this opportunity because we we uh, we uh, drawing parallel between Iraq war and uh, what is happening in Ukraine. Remember on on Iraq war, they've been they had been searching for months and months. You know, we had uh, you know many people going over to Iraq, find looking for weapons of mass destruction. You know, it was and we we all knew it was fake all along. In reality, when you look at Ukraine, they do have, they're actually working on weapons of mass destructions. You know, uh, Nolan, she was, you know, uh, she, she actually said that they, they had uh, biolabs, uh, US funded biolabs all around Ukraine. And remember one thing at the Munich conference, Zelensky said, he was openly saying, well, we are going to break the Bucharest Accord. The Bucharest Accord was, uh, you you hand over your nuclear missiles to Russia back then, you know, and uh, against that, Russia was uh, protecting uh, Ukraine sovereignty. Well, he wants to break. He wanted to break down this accord, meaning that he wanted actually to work on on nuclear missiles. That is extremely dangerous because Ukraine has the technology. You know, they have all the technology to launch missiles. And they have nuclear power plants. They, 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 you know, they could achieve that in a matter of months. So now you have ample proof that they were doing that, you know. And so yes. additional to that, there are ample proofs of genocide. You know, there's a, there was genocide happening in Donbas. They killed 14,000 people. You know, the most radical in Ukraine, they were actually calling to invade Donbas and put them into camps. And they'll be screening which, were, which one were good Ukrainians, which one were bad Ukrainians. So we, we were about to face a, a, a huge genocide and, and this was all planned and, 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 and backed by the US. Yes, uh, and there was the language law where they were trying to outlaw the use of the Russian language in public. So, so these were all things that Ukraine was openly doing that the US in fiction accuses China of doing to say the, the, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. So it's just, it's just, I, it, it just shows you that the US does not actually care about it. Just getting what it wants and it'll say whatever it wants, no matter how hypocritical or dishonest it is. And that this is the perfect example. I, I want to show this one. This is a good one too. China doesn't need to invade Taiwan. Time and economics is on China's side. Only issue is the US is inciting and funding Taiwan to declare independence. Yes, absolutely. Um, this, is the, this is the problem. Uh, all things being, being equal, if the US did not go into Ukraine and overthrow the government, I, I believe that uh, Ukraine would have remained neutral, and then as time went on, a lot of the the bad the bad blood between Ukraine and Russia would have been cleaned out, and uh, they would have had a very constructive relationship with both Russia and Europe because Europe would have eventually, if the U.S. did not continuously artificially maintain its hegemony over Western Europe, uh, all of this would have come out into the multipolar world. This is what was happening. And so the US went in there, artificially overthrew the government, installed the client regime, uh, artificially cut all relations uh, off between Ukraine and Russia and created this crisis that led up to what we're seeing right now. And they're doing the exact same thing in Taiwan. Uh, just like uh, our audience member says, 
just giving it time and leaving it alone, Taiwan will eventually reunify with China. If you look at their economy and their trade, they completely depended on mainland China. Uh, this, will, this will eventually happen. It's inevitable and there's nothing that can be done to stop it. And no one wants to stop it. And so they had to overthrow the government in Taiwan install this pro-independence uh, client regime that answers to Washington, not to the people in Taiwan. They're irrationally cutting their ties with the mainland, hurting the economy in Taiwan, just like Ukraine did. And they're hosting US troops. So uh, I just wanna show you uh, this. I, I've showed this many times. This is the US admitting they've got US troops in Taiwan, despite recognizing the one China policy and the fact that uh, China sees Taiwan as part of their territory. This is highly provocative. The US is doing this deliberately to create a conflict with China. They are going to do everything in their power to cross China's red lines and provoke a conflict. Uh, and uh, there was this, Indo-Pacific Command proposes new missile capabilities to deter China. This is 2021. And they're talking about putting missiles in Taiwan, in the Philippines, everywhere, just ringing China with US missiles. And all of this goes back to this 2016 paper, which a lot of people will try to dismiss, but it is a paper that's preparing for conventional war with China to disrupt Chinese shipping, maritime shipping, and everything in this paper has been implemented. This is an implementation of the RAND Corporation policy. Uh, this is, uh, the, the U.S. Marine Corps getting rid of all of its tanks after decades and decades of having tanks and switching over to ship hunting to close down straits all across Indo the Indo-Pacific region goes back to this 2016 paper calling for stopping Chinese shipping to cripple its economy and collapse its government. So just as the U.S. created an existential threat to Russia in Ukraine, they're doing the exact same thing uh, in Taiwan and also the, the South China Sea, because that's what this is about. This is the US complaining about China militarizing the South China Sea, but not admitting the existential threat the US is creating for China in the South China Sea. And I, I wanna point out this one, one other thing. This is from CSIS, which is a US government arms manufacturing funded think tank. Uh, this is how much trade transits the South China Sea. So is, is it in China's best interest to disrupt trade in the South China Sea or to protect it? This is 26% of total South China Sea exports benefits China. So it, it's the, going to be the biggest loser. Let's see the United States. Uh, I think we got to go this way. Look how U.S. doesn't care about the South China Sea. They don't, they don't care about disrupting that. And in the RAND Corporation paper, it even says, uh, it, it, if it is a year long conflict, the US will suffer economically, but China will suffer more. And that's why they want to fight it. And, and so this is what the US is planning. This is what they're writing in their policy papers. This is what they're implementing as policy in the Indo-Pacific region all around China. This is why China is going to support Russia, because they understand that what's going on with Russia is part of a, a larger plan to encircle and contain China that goes back decades and transcends every presidency without exception. Angela, you want to uh, add anything to that? Yeah, well, I think what China is doing is, is actually learning a lot from Russia. So China is working uh, the same as what Russia did the last eight years. It's working on its self-sufficiency. And the weak point of China is that it lacks the resources, natural resources that Russia has. So when you look at now the sanctions, what, are, what is it doing to Russia? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. In reality, the prices of oil and gas are going up and they are still there. They haven't shut down the supply of gas and oil to Europe. And it, it will not do that in the next few years because Europe is dependent on Russia gas. You cannot switch off overnight now i want to go back to taiwan it's really important just you know this is something that we are going to focus more and more in the last few in the next few months it's even though like average taiwanese they are for status quo you know it's, it's very interesting to see how they frame the question are you for independence and and most of them I and mean, many of them they say well i'm for the independence but but I'm, I'm i'm for the status quo and that that's a huge difference it's, if you say independence or not, that's very different. I used to live in Taiwan 27 years ago. I spent a year in Taiwan and then the last 25 years in, in the mainland China. And, and I know how, how they think. 
you know, they, they Chinese, they're very down to earth. They want prosperity. That's, that's what they focus. Most of Chinese are not politicized. What now in Taiwan, they're getting politicized. Well, why? Because you have NED, National Endowment for Democracy, which has poured lots of money into the civil society, NGOs, you know, po political parties and media. And they've kicked out dissent voices, the same as they did in, in Ukraine. They've kicked out pro-Russian voices. Well, in Taiwan, they did the same. They kicked out pro-Chinese voices. So now you have only one narrative in Taiwan. And uh, so it's what we call hijacking a democracy. So, uh, and then you have a huge difference between what the population want and what the political party want. Uh, the DPP, we did some research, you and I, uh, uh, Brian, since 2004, Tsai Ing-wen, she was having secret meetings with the AIT. AIT is the de facto uh, US embassy in Taiwan. So she was, Tsai Ing-wen, she was having secret meetings already then. She, she, it's obvious, she's a US agent. She's, they propped her up. You know, the, you know, she was on Time Magazine. They, they were, she was not chosen by Taiwanese. She was chosen by the US. And then they put lots of money because they, they needed her there. And uh, so, so you see, it's, uh, it, it's, very, it's, it's very sad. It's another democracy which, is, which has been hijacked the same as, as Ukraine. Uh, so now, um, well, we, we have to hope that the next election, CPP doesn't go through. Because if it goes through, then you have, uh, you have a window of opportunity for the US to attack China. You know, and what are the red lines for China? It's very simple, you know, you don't want uh, U.S. troops on, on Taiwanese soil. You don't want Taiwan to declare independence. Um, as simple as that. You, you know, it's just the status quo is fine. You know, and, and in reality, for, for, you know, status quo can go on for, for, you know, 50 years. There's no problem, you know, as long as you don't declare independence. But if you look at the economy, uh, the reality on the ground, you have 50% of uh, Taiwanese trade that is done with the mainland. You have... a only officially 1 million Taiwanese that live in the mainland, you know, and we are talking about, you know, the, the brightest minds, you know, I mean, unofficially, you know, this figure might go up to 2 million people. So de facto, you know, there's, there are interconnections and this, this piece, you know, what, um, but ne then you have always the U.S., which is actually putting in the, in the mind of Taiwanese, well, why don't you confront China? The same as, as, uh, as the U.S. did with Ukraine. They said, oh, you know what? We have your back. Well, they're doing the same with Taiwanese. And again, you have this new generation of Taiwanese. They were brought up with books, you know, revised books on history that actually changed completely their history. Now you have Taiwanese saying, well, we are Westerners. We have Western values. You know what I mean? This is the, this whole brainwashing. And we saw that also in Hong Kong was the same, you know. In Hong Kong, we didn't have national security law. You know, you had, I mean, millions and millions of dollars being poured in civil society to brainwash people, the mind of people. That, that, that's really important. And they did the exact same thing in Ukraine. All of these fanatics that refused to put down their, their weapons, they were, they were going to Nazi day camp uh, a couple of years ago. This was what was going on in Ukraine uh, under the US-backed client regime put in since 2014. Th those kids that were going to Nazi summer camp are now the fanatics who refuse to put their weapons out, just like the Hitler youth during World War II. They were the most fanatical fighters, just like ISIS, the, this US, uh, Saudi, Qatari-backed uh, just fanatics and they they live in an alternate reality and they they don't they don't actually know what they're really doing they just know what they think they're doing and so you have that and people will say well you know if the ukrainians want this then shouldn't they be allowed to do this if the, the youth in taiwan want this shouldn't they be allowed isn't that democracy and self-determination self-determination means self-determination it means they decided this on their own it, uh, and if you have billions of dollars being pumped into a political system from another country, then that is not self-determination. With enough money and enough time, you can convince people of anything, including things that are completely contrary to their own best self-interest. And Ukraine is a perfect example. They, ha they all collectively have jumped off this cliff together uh, because the U.S. put this idea in their head that, that is completely contradictive to 
uh, their own best interests. Their own best interests were to benefit from the West and the East, R relationship with Russia and with Western Europe. That that was the best for them. And they completely threw that away because the US invested, uh, by the time the US overthrew the government in 2014, Victoria Nuland, who at the time was in the US State Department, admitted that they pumped $5 billion into Ukraine's internal political affairs. That is interference. That is not Ukraine deciding on their own for anything. That is the US pumping money in and deciding for them. They do the same thing. Uh, they were doing it in Hong Kong. They were doing it in Taiwan. They're doing it here in Thailand. The US government is com completely funding these opposition, the core groups involved in the anti-government and anti-monarchy protests. That is the US doing that. It's not people drawing these conclusions themselves. And if you sit down and you talk to them and really ask them, you know, what is it that you wanna do that the government's not letting you do? They can't answer. They have no answer. They are brainwashed. They are fanatics who have been brainwashed. It's like any, any cult, the person is not connected to reality. Uh, and so it's extremely dangerous. Uh, what, what the U.S. is doing in Taiwan is extremely dangerous. And like I said, you already see them looking for excuses to put sanctions and carry all of this hysteria and hate that they have created. That's another perfect example, not, not to jump all over here, but look at how people overnight suddenly became in love with Ukraine and this just fanatical... Uh, uh, irrational and completely insane hatred for Russia over almost overnight. And this was purely produced by the, the Western media. These people have, were not paying attention to what was going on in Ukraine the last eight years. They know nothing about Russia, only except what they see in the Western media. And so this just, just goes to show you how easy it is to manipulate the public. So when you talk about democracy, self-determination, a nation deciding this or that, you need to follow the money and make sure that they did actually decide that themselves and it's in their own best interests. Or if this is a product of US interference, it is a global empire, they openly admit they pump billions into each of these countries that they're meddling in. Uh, I don't I don't know uh, if there was something you wanted to add to that. Well, I, I, I think we, we should go back, I mean, really to this Nazi movement. It's, it, I think people, do, they have no idea what is going on. In, in Ukraine, it, it's extreme. I think the same as we we created the ISIS and Al Qaeda. Remember, I mean, uh, we were the I mean, Western countries funded, you know, they propped up those those movements, and they actually they became the Frankenstein, you know, creators that actually backfired. And this is extremely dangerous. What we did in Ukraine, we created the the, the equivalent of the SS, you know, that actually had the real power in in Germany. Remember, you know, just they, they could kill whoever they wanted. You know, and the, the Wehrmacht, the 90% the of the army, they were like regular people. So what happened in, in Ukraine is that those people, they are behind Zelensky and he cannot do anything. Uh, you know what happened in Minsk II agreement? They, they killed one of the negotiators because he was too yeah. smooth. Uh, on yeah. Recently, uh, uh, um, a, a few weeks ago, they killed another negotiator because supposedly he was, he was pro-Russian. Uh, maybe be, because he was doing concessions. So what happened in Mariupol, you know, the, what they did was to create this movement because they needed radicals, you know, cosmopolitans. Kids like, like nowadays, they play Nintendo, they, they're not radicalized, you know, they, but then if you brainwash them, you make them angry, okay? angry against who? You know, against Roms, you know, like uh, gypsies, against Jewish, and against, when it comes to Ukraine, against Russians. So this is why now, you know, why did the Russians, they focus on Mariupol and this cauldron where you have Nazis? Because they know once they, they kill those Nazis, they, they get rid of those Nazis, then you, you are going to have a surrender. Now, the Ukrainian army is not surrendering. Why? Because they'd be killed by yes. those, those, those radicals. And they, they're willing to die, you know, because they, they're completely brainwashed. But this is an, an extreme big danger. We have created an analysis in Europe. Imagine if you have those radicals now, they become ref refugees in Europe. It will happen the same as we had the UCK. You know, remember the UCK, the, the Kosovo radicals. I mean, it was, it was labeled a, a terrorist organization. Well, they ended up being refugees in Europe and they started actually uh, ma mafia gangs, you know, they took over, you know, like uh, human trafficking, and and, and that would be that would be the same with those radicals, but even more. I mean, they they yeah, they're I, nuts. They're completely nuts. I, yeah. yeah. 
I don't know. I don't know if you can see when I put that. Can you see when I put a comment up on the screen, Angela? Yeah, yeah, I can. I can. Okay. So I, yeah, I just wanted because you were just talking about this. So Twitter is silencing accounts left and right for showing pictures of civilians tied up to street lamps in Ukraine. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, because Twitter and Facebook, along with the US State Department, whom they work with, and the rest of the Western media, they do not want you talking about Nazis in Ukraine. They do not want you showing what they're doing. And, and Angela, that is a really good point that you just made about uh, why they're focusing on Mariupol, this nexus of, of Nazism, in, because that's where they sent them all as part of containing uh, Eastern Ukraine and all along the line of contact. These are where the most experienced, uh, most well-equipped soldiers were sent. And they cannot just pick up and leave because where are they going to go? They're already dug in there. They know if they pick up and they, they run, they're going to be easy targets. And so uh, it's a cauldron. It's a cauldron because it's like almost completely encircled with just a little bit of room for escape where you really can't escape. Uh, it's an encirclement, and you're absolutely right. If they are liquidated or otherwise neutralized, you know, uh, whether they surrender or, or if they refuse to surrender and they're eliminated, uh, who's going to threaten everyone else who wants to compromise and come back to reality? And the answer is they they won't be there won't be any left. So this is very important. Um, hold on, I just saw someone say, "Isn't Russia also employing Nazis? The Wagner Group and Sparta Battalion? No, they're not." No, they're not. Uh, Azov Battalion is an official formation within Ukraine's armed forces. It is the only nation on earth right now that has actual Nazis uh, under the banner of Nazism in their armed forces. It's, it's not like a couple slipped through the cracks. Uh, Spartan, Spartan uh, is, this is a, uh, this is one of the separatist forces in Eastern Ukraine. They couldn't be less, I don't know where they got Oh, they're Nazis. If you, any picture you see them, they're covered in St. George ribbons. Uh, they, they're, they're like, it's, you know, like the St. George ribbon is like uh, to Nazis as garlic is to a vampire. They're not, they're not Nazis. I, I've not seen any evidence to suggest that they're Nazis. And the Wagner Group is this nebulous uh, private organization that they claim has some sort of connection to the Russian government and they don't show any evidence of that. And so how are you, you picking uh, uh, some kind of private organization, very nebulous, no evidence. How are you citing that? And then Spart the Spartan battalion, how are you connecting that to Nazism and comparing that to Azov? Azov and Idar and several others are actually officially in Ukraine's armed forces. They are an entire military formation of Nazis in Ukraine's armed forces. The only country in the world doing this right now. Angela, yeah, yeah. you want to add on to this? Yes, I get yes. this all the time. This is extremely important. I mean, a lot of people, they don't understand. They, they are neo-Nazi movements around Europe and the US. But those ones, they're not, they're not the radicals. You know, they, they are like kind, kind of an anti-system and they romanticize the, 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 you know, Hitler. They just romanticize, but they're not in for the killing. What you have in Ukraine is very different. This is the real deal. This is a continuation of the Nazi of the World War II. They are in for the killing. What you have around the world, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not impressed. When I see a, a neo-Nazi around the world, I mean, they're not, they, they might not even hate Jews. They, they don't even care. They just romanticize. You know, it's like those people, oh, I want the next cool thing. It's not, it's not, it's just stupid. Of course, you have, a, you know, a swastikas on your body. It's extremely stupid, but I don't associate this with hate. I'm not scared of those ones. But if I was to go to Ukraine and have those guys in front of me, I would be scared because those guys, they're in for the killing. They're in for killing Russians. And that's what yeah. they do. That's what they do. There's a huge difference. You know, I, when I grew up here in Switzerland and I have friends, neo-Nazis. I mean, just, you know, they were just stupid, just stupid. And they, they were like far from being violent, you know, in for the killing. What you have in Ukraine is the real deal. Wake up. This is the real deal. This is why they, 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 they need, desperately needed them to fight the Russians because otherwise the regular army wouldn't fight the Russians. I, I just wanna show you this. This is from Time Magazine. It's been online since January 9th, 2021. And now look, and, and there was no restriction or anything on this video. Now they've done this because this is what people were saying. Hey, 
uh, there are actual Nazis in Ukraine's military, in their armed forces. They're not, they're not like a couple of guys who slip through the cracks in, in one or two particular units. It is an entire formation with summer camps for children, uh, with uh, infantry, artillery, tank forces, because uh, Azov Battalion is a misnomer. That is just what they call themselves, but it is not a battalion. It is much larger than a battalion. Uh, so when you click on this to proceed, uh, they are going to show you Azov, and they they are just straight up not. They, this is this is a Nazi symbol. It's not, you know, like in the U.S. military, they find Nazis from time to time and then they kick them out. Uh, this is a whole formation under the the symbol of of Nazism. And this is Time Magazine. So you go and show me a video like this about Wagner or Sparta. You go show me a video where the evidence is this compelling, and then I think you might have a point. And until then, you're just repeating like, like a parrot or like a dog barking uh, things that you heard the Western TV tell you, just like they told you Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. You know, trying to claim that Russia is somehow the Nazis when in Ukraine, they got, literally got swastikas all over them. And, and they're running around with guns. It's just, it's just one of those times in history where the West has just completely gone off the rails with the propaganda. And when people fall for this, you can't even talk to them. And this is what has been stressing me out for the last month, Angela, I don't know about you. I mean, I find myself sitting there having to explain to people why Nazis are bad. I never thought in, in all of my life of all the dumb things that I would have to explain to people I never thought I would have to explain this, but uh, apparently you do. And 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 as people have been pointing out in the, the the comment section, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, they're just deleting people for talking about this. When Time Magazine covered it, The Guardian covered it, Reuters covered it. I, I have videos and articles where I go through all of the mainstream media, including U.S. State Department funded, uh, what is it, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, where they are talking about Nazis in Ukraine. Uh, this was a thing. This is a thing. They just decided to cover it up now, just like how they tried to rehabilitate Al Qaeda and even ISIS in in Syria and Iraq because they were it was convenient politically because the U.S. will find the lowest. Uh, the lowest common denominator in any given country, anyone willing to work with them, which is usually violent, uh, criminal, racist, extremists. These are the type of people that gravitate to, toward working with the U.S., and that's who they end up having to work with. So it's, it's, it would be comical if people weren't dying by the thousands or tens of thousands. Uh, but, you know, the fact that they're linked up with Al Qaeda and ISIS in the Middle East with literal Nazis in Eastern U Europe, because it's not just, again, it's not just Ukraine. You have uh, uh, Nazi extremists in, in Belarus when they were protesting and they had this white and red flag. That is not Belarus's flag. That is the flag of Nazi collaborators from World War II, just like the red and black flag was the Ukrainian Nazi collaborator. So it's all hidden in plain view. Everyone can see this. If you're watching the BBC, you will see the white and red flag. The BBC just won't tell you what it means. Uh, you you want to add, I think this is a really important uh, point. So uh, Angela, if you want to add even more to that, please. Well, extremely important. Uh, well, Stepan Bandera, he was, he was elected, you know, like the, the hero of the nation. I mean, we are talking about a Nazi collaborator during World War II. Uh, you know, like uh, it was SS Galicia, it was, they were terrible yeah, and they were in for the killing. Uh, so they had big problems with, uh, I mean, they, they had two enemies, the communists and the Jews. So it was very easy for them to partner with the Nazis. So what happened after World War II, they remember this Gladio operation, they were actually, lots of Nazis were recycled. They were recycling to European politics in NATO, you know, they were sent back to the, sent to the US, you know, uh, and the paperclip as well, you know, there's just so many Nazis. And Stempen Bandera was exfiltrated to Germany. And uh, in reality, this neo-Nazi movement never stopped. It was always there in Ukraine. Uh, this, because, because that was the, the idea of glad operation. You, you leave behind agents. So, all along, even on the, when the, you know, when there was an iron curtain, they were, they were doing stuff underground and they revived, uh, since the 1990s, they revived that, you know, the, 
because because when you look at the the history of Ukraine, you have those tensions, you know, the those divides. It's not a natural country because you have, uh, you know, on the on the west you have uh, minorities, you have uh, uh, that are Catholics. They're not Orthodox, uh, Polish and Hungarian. Then you have in the center the real Ukrainians, and then on the east you have the Germans, uh, not the Germans, the the Russians. So what they did it was the divide and conquer. You know how you can divide. You know uh, people have been living alongside for centuries. How you can divide them? It's very easy, you know. And they've they've been doing that. Imperialist power. They've been doing that all around the world forever. If you go to India, they would they would go go inside India and see uh, which which uh, which kingdom I can I can put against uh, which kingdom. Uh, we've seen that in in Burma, in Myanmar, same. You know how how can I divide them so I can better control them? They, they tried the same. They they instigated hatred between ukrainians you know they were living together for long i mean alongside you know like uh, uh and they they have the same the same roots you know i mean remember ukraine kiev used to be the capital of of russia a, yes. a long time ago you know it's imagine for russian uh what it is to the the pride of russian having having kiev you know like be turning neo nazi i mean nazis when Russians suffered 27 million people died, but not for Russia. They died for us, for the free world. They died for us. And what we did was to impose a Nazi movement in Ukraine. That's what we did. Yes. And I just want to show people in case they think you're making this up for some reason, Angelo. This is NASA.gov biography of Werner von Braun. He was the he was like the top the scientist, rocket scientist for NASA during the Apollo program, sending the first people to the moon. And they say right here on NASA's official website, Von Braun was a member of the Nazi party and an SS officer. And these rockets that he was built, and it says Operation Project Project paperclip right here. So you're not, you're not making this up, Angelo. This is the U US government's own uh, NASA.gov telling you that this is what they did. They got this Nazi rocket scientist who ended up heading NASA's program, uh, the rocket manned space program, essentially. And they, they, you know, some people say, well, you know, it's complicated and, and I don't know, maybe it, maybe it was, but his V2 rockets that he was building for Germany, I mean, they were built by slaves, basically, uh, uh, slave labor, the, the people in the camps that, Germany was locking up. They were the ones building these rockets. There's really no way he didn't know that. And he was going along with it. So I don't know. And then they had someone like that working for NASA. And so this is what the US constantly does. And then for them to try to get the moral high ground on anyone anywhere. And they're still doing it's not like they did that in the past and they're repentant. They're doing it right now in Ukraine. They're using actual Nazis to fight Russia, to create an existential threat on Russia's border. So uh, there's also that. Brian, do you, do you want to touch a little something about Russophobia? What is happening, this madness around the world? And, and, and actually, oh, yeah. uh, I'd like to draw a parallel to what happened in World War II. And, and we might go through the same, the same. It's just complete madness. And, and, and I wanted so just to, you know, to touch a little bit in the psychology of people, you know, how, how people have been viewing Russians, but this is through Hollywood, you know. Just think about it in the last 20 years. When was last time you saw a Russian being pictured on a positive, you know, to have a positive picture? You know, just, you know, they've been picturing, and this, is, this goes in the subconscious mind of people. What, when, they, when they think Russian, you know, it's a reptilian mind. When, when they think Russian, what do they think about? They think about, you know, the gangster, the violent guy, and when, when it's a woman, it's a prostitute. And, and, and you see this, those stereotypes, They've been shaping the mind of people. So now when people think about, you know, putting Russian and so on, it turns like completely black. It's like, oh, evil. It's the same as, you know, when, you know, when, when they've been brainwashing us on, on, on the, 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 the Nazis, you know, I mean, uh, we were bad too, you know, I mean, we killed uh, two, two, two uh, uh, nuclear bombs. So that is extremely dangerous. We need to be careful because the next step, if we are, we are not in, even at war with Russia, what is the next step? Are we going to put them in concentration camps? I mean, this is how mad the people has gone. 
question, question a little bit, you know, I mean, a critical mind, because I mean, where we go, where are we going? I mean, the history, they want to cancel Tchaikovsky, they want to cancel Dostoevsky. I mean, this is so much, I mean, this is so much deep history. It's part of our history too. And, and people, yeah. they're just people, you know, they, uh, uh, you, you know, and, and Putin, I mean, I mean, Putin is popular to Russians. We don't need to love Putin, but you know, the Russians love him because he's been good to his country. Yes. And I, and I want people to pay very close attention to what's going on uh, across the Western world and what they're trying to encourage elsewhere beyond the Western world, this just irrational hatred of Russia. Now, if the facts were in the West's favor, they would make a logical argument. The facts would speak for themselves. And it would be so damning that uh, it, things would fall into place naturally. But because they are constantly working against the truth, they have had to uh, appeal to, like you say, like the reptilian brain, just people's basest of instincts and hatred and phobias and prey on that so that they can sidestep any sort of rational argument. Because if you have a rational argument about what's going on in Ukraine, it does not favor the US. The, the, the US is the one who created this crisis and is perpetuating it. And uh, so, so you got to think about that and then look at what they're doing. You said they're, they're canceling classical music. I mean, even if, you, even if you for some reason thought that Putin was evil and Russia was evil, this, this music was written before there was even, a, in some cases, there's some of these things that they're going after is before there was even a Soviet Union, let alone a Russian Federation. So it makes no sense at all. Again, it's just blatant and open racism and uh, bigotry. And what they're doing right now is going to look like the good old days when this is flipped and then turned against China because there was, there's always been this animosity against Asians and China in particular, just under the surface, especially in the US. I grew up in the US and I, so I know this. I was around people who didn't like Asian people and hated China. And when they can finally come out openly and express this, it, it, there will be just like we see right now toward Russians, just this extremely dangerous uh, aggression, violence, uh, abuse. This is what we're seeing right now towards Russians. It'll be a thousand times worse when, it, when it's turned or uh, let loose on China. And everyone is going to suffer. All Asians are going to suffer. If you think somehow, well, I'm not chi Chinese. Well, do you, do you think an American who is thinking like this is going to be able to distinguish you between someone who is from China? No, the answer is no. Uh, so this is something very dangerous that they are setting up. You can see it coming from a mile away. And uh, people say that I'm an alarmist or that I'm fear mongering, but we just saw it done to Russia and they are most definitely working on doing it to China. So I'm just telling, I don't know what the answer is to it, except to condemn it and warn people about it. But just ask yourself, where do you wanna be when this all happens? You know, I'm, I'm in Thailand, so I'm 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 relatively okay, but even, not even, not really. Uh, but if I was in the U.S., I, I mean, I see people trying to get the truth out there about about what's going on in Russia right now. They are in the U.S. and they're walking on eggshells so that they don't get completely deleted from the media. And if things continue to spiral downward, there this could end up being some sort of criminal, some sort of criminal action. Just telling the truth will become criminal. And you will get in tr legal trouble. You will be facing legal trouble. As a matter of fact, in Eastern Europe, there are people being arrested for supporting Russia. That, that's happening. Yeah, and can I? Uh, uh, this is something extremely important. People think that uh, it's going to be they're, they're safe just by having a U.S. passport. I mean, just forget about this. This is going to be about ethnicity. Uh, I'm just going back to World War II. There were 120,000 Japanese. Ethnic Japanese with a U.S. passport, they were put in internment camps. If this was to happen in the U.S., you would have Asians, and it would be indiscriminate. You know, I mean, Asians and Chinese, even second, third generation, there's a possibility they would put them in camps. This is, you know, it's it's not, it's the same that we have. It's the same, you know, we, we're not even, even at war, you see this cancel movement. Uh, it would it would be about ethnicity, not nationalities. Forget it. It's not going to be about nationalities because they they will actually question uh, how I mean you you position when it comes to to national security. 
So you still, you look Chinese, it doesn't matter, you know, you, your second, third generation, it doesn't matter to us. They will question that, you know, so it, it's going to come down to ethnicity. So you see that, you know, the races we see now in, in the U.S., you have people, Russian have been living for forever in, in, in the U.S., and they're being targeted, and we're not even at war with Russia. Imagine what's going to come up come out after and, and and you said it right you know they, they they can't sing dissent voices i mean so many people they, they're just scared you, you know and, and 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 a lot of people you can see influencers they they don't want to take side just because they know there's a, a huge, huge price to pay you know it's uh they, they, maybe they've been siding for for china but they, they're like should i side with russia even though it's right to side with russia well no it's there's a heavy price to pay yes and you, you said it perfectly. The U.S. is not even at war with Russia, but there's just the, the hatred and contempt that they have for any nation that stands up to them in any way, let alone the, the, the very uh, aggressive way Russia has stood up to the West. Uh, so, so there's that. But then just imagine, because we see what the U.S. in their own words, what they are preparing to do to China. And you have to understand, they are they are willing to sacrifice the U.S. Navy to do this. If they can tie China up for a year and destroy its economy, they don't care if their entire fleet goes to the bottom of the ocean. As long as they derailed China's economy long enough to, to collapse it or semi-collapse it and buy the, buy the U.S. another 10, 20 years of hegemony over the world. This is something, this is a price they're willing to pay. Uh, they're not going to have a non- white nation surpass them. They're not, you, they, they are saying they're not going to. And so can you imagine what it would be like to be an Asian American af after China sends a US warship to the bottom of the ocean in, in the middle of this war, the US is openly planning to, to start with China uh, with hundreds or even thousands of US sailors on board. Could you imagine what it would be like to be an Asian in the United States? And again, I'm not doing this to be fear mongering. I'm just saying, if that were to happen, you need to think of how to protect yourself. When you see people being deleted, like I was deleted off of Twitter, uh, one of the first people deleted off of Twitter after this this whole Ukraine thing started. And, and then I, I'm watching other people get deleted off of YouTube and Facebook and everywhere else. So I'm preparing. I'm preparing for myself to be the next, the next one deleted off of YouTube or wherever. You have to start preparing. Don't wait until it's it's already happening. When it's already happening, it's too late to do anything. If you're in the U.S. Tr trying to get out in the middle of this hysteria, just just think of how that's going to be, how that's going to play out. It's not going to play out well. And I, I don't wish that on anyone. And I, I, I hope that by us putting this information out and trying to inform people and, and encouraging people to wake up other people, we can somehow prevent this or minimize it as much as possible. But if you can't prevent it, what are you going to do to prepare for it, to protect yourself when it happens? Uh, Angela, I don't know if you have any uh, advice on, well, on that. It's more on the viewer. As a, you know, if you can, uh, if you can support uh, Brian's channel's uh, new atlas, I mean, Brian is, is putting lots of energy into this. He's, he's put himself at risk. Uh, you know, he, he's out there. He's been out there, not, not from yesterday. I've been following Brian for a decade now. He was writing under the pen name of uh, Tony Catalucci. And it's very important. It's it's uh, you know is one of those heroes that actually is is willing to take the the heat you know uh, for for telling the truth. So if you can help his channels, you know you have a Patreon, uh, you know account, you know uh, buy me a coffee. I mean, uh, and and again, you know there's there's a risk that they might cancel this channel just because at some point we it's we are going to be canceled, every, everyone. So I, I, I want you, I mean, if you can help uh, uh, Brian's channel. And, then, and I have a big respect for, for uh, what you do, Brian. It's just, just amazed. You know, it's, uh, I know what it is to take a hit, you know, to be hammered. You know, it's, this is inconvenient truth, just to be out there and saying, you know, we, we, we're going against our country, but it's not. Actually, people see it wrong. We're not going against our country. We are frustrated that our country is being hijacked by elites. And ultimately, who's going to pay is American people, is European people. This is my frustration. Deep inside, I do love my country. I mean, really. And this is why I'm there, out there, just saying that what is my country is doing is wrong. Because I care for my country and my people. But the problem is that we have countries that are being hijacked. Ultimately, going to war with Russia and China 
It's not going to benefit avid people. Who's going to pay for inflation now? It's people, you know, and, 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 and who's going to benefit is the military industrial complex and the elites. It's over. It's always the same problem. So when you are having Ukraine flag just to co look cool, just think about it. Was it a planted idea? Oh, is it like fruitful? I mean, are you, are you, are you, is it, is it working on your side? It's not, it's not. You're doing what they want you to do. Yes. Uh, and, and Angela, thank you. And uh, I just want people to know when I first started doing videos, it was because behind the scenes, Angelo and, and some of the people that he, he works with to help get information out, they, they encouraged me to do it and they helped me make my first couple of videos. And uh, Angela has been indispensable ever since doing this uh, almost weekly pr program that we do. Uh, I'm on YouTube right now, but uh, I also have this channel on Odyssey and I also have my videos being backed up automatically on Rumble. And all of the links to this and ways to support my work and ways to share my work it is all in the video description below in every one of my videos. So you can check that out. I want to, I want because we're past one hour now. I want to thank everyone for tuning in live. If you're watching this afterwards, please like and share it. It really does. It really does help. And please start looking at where you can find not just myself on other platforms, but everyone in the alternative media that you follow and whose work you respect. And there's a lot of them out there, which is a good thing. Uh, start looking at where you can find them elsewhere because uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, they've made it very clear that uh, you're not going to have an opinion. You're going to repeat what they say. And if you don't, you're gone. That's where we're headed. And this is just the beginning, what they're doing with Russia. It's going to be many times worse when it's China's turn. And just as we showed you, every, every, you know, the headlines are overwhelmed with news about Ukraine and Russia's operations there and the situation in Europe. But if you read the news every single day, they're getting ready to, to do the exact same thing to China. So uh, we're going to keep an eye on this. Uh, again, thank you, everyone. A again, thank you very much, Angelo. And until next time, bye for now.